So this is a patient who had come to me with severe eye pain. He had been to many places and, uh, and used many drops, but then there was no relief of his pain. So when he came to us, and I happened to look inside his eye, I saw something white moving inside there. Now watch closely in this patient's eye. There is a silvery, shiny object inside the patient's eye. Now when the nurse with the cotton bud touches the eye, there is some exaggerated movement. And it looks like coils inside the eye. This can mean only one thing. There is some living object inside the eye that looks and behaves like a worm. Now we have to make sure that this is indeed a worm. If it is a worm, it will on likelihood escape to other parts of the body the moment we touch it or interfere with it. So to prevent that, now the nurse has barred its posterior movement with a cotton bud. Now the cotton bud has to be placed at least near the center of where the worm's body is. That will prevent the worm from sliding back into the eye and behind into the brain. Now I made an opening into the conjunctiva, which is not the seeing part of the eye. This is only the white portion of the eye. Now we can see some white cylindrical tubes likely to be a worm. I am pulling that out and you will be astounded to see the length of this worm. And mind you, it is a live worm. You can see the head moving. Now I am trying to untangle it and pull it out. But I feel that the distal part, that means the end part of it has got caught somewhere in the eye. Now I will be putting the rest of the worm back into the eye or onto the eye, not into the eye, in the hope that it will relieve itself from the eye. Now watch carefully as the worm starts wriggling out of the eye. Now it has wriggled free from the eye and I can see both the ends. And this is the time I know that it is not going to go anywhere else. It is going to be here and I have all the time in the world to take it out. And I can be reasonably sure that no part of the worm is now going to remain inside the patient's eye. Now, I have taken it out, goes into a glass bottle for safekeeping. Now, all that remains to be done now is reassure the patient that I have taken out everything and then close that tiny wound. It does not require any sutures because it is a very tiny wound and heal itself within 24 hours. What we have seen just now is a worm that was living inside a human eye. Now we have successfully managed to take it out. Not all people are so lucky. It can escape our attention also. Now the important thing about this worm is, in recorded history, in video history, this is the largest worm ever recorded. This is 8 inches long. And the previous recorded worm was 5 inches long. Now how did this massive worm get inside the eye? That is a very interesting story. It starts in Africa. The worm Loa Loa, which is the worm we took out now, is endemic to Western Africa. It is spread by flies. The flies are called mangrove flies. It is a particular way the the fly infects the human, that is of great interest. Unlike the mosquito, the fly does not bite the human. Instead, it uses its mouth parts to create a tear on the body of the human and it licks the blood that comes out, unlike a mosquito that sucks the blood. So this is the fly that hosts the egg or the larvae of the worm. And the licking action of the fly onto the human skin and the blood transfers this worm to the human and in the human body it matures and becomes an adult worm. It can travel to many areas of the human body but the most common is eye. It may be that 
the worm can be seen naturally in the eye only because that is the only transparent area of the body. The other reason is the eye is the coolest part of the body because it is exposed and the worm seeks out the coolest part. But it is known to occur in the brain and the subconjunctive, subcutaneous that is under the skin. It can also occur in the heart and the lungs. But the eye is the most common. And loa loa is not the only worm that infects humans like this. There is another worm called dirofilaria. That is spread by mosquitoes. Now, how did this Western African worm come to India and particularly to Asia? That is also an interesting part of the story. The fly has to reach Asia and India in particular. It cannot fly across the continents. So something has carried it here. It is likely that container ships are the mode of transport. Unsuspecting flies on container trips or in cargoes land up in warehouses in Asia and India and the flies have come to India. Now how does the fly know that the human is there? And it, it, it is interesting to note that it bites only humans. Even though we say that monkeys or simians are cousins of humans, it does not bite monkeys. There is no recorded history of ever that happened. And there is no lower lower infestation in monkeys. It seeks out humans. This fly resides in the forest. The attraction for fly is carbon dioxide. And the forest at night produces a lot of carbon dioxide because of trees. But the flies seek out humans and bite them. It is thought that humans nowadays produce more carbon dioxide. How? We have a lot of waste in our houses or in our surroundings. The easy way we find to dispose of them is to burn them. So once we have wood burning or paper burning, there is a lot of carbon dioxide released. And the fly, for the fly it is a magnet. The fly also thrives on decaying foodstuff and decaying animals. That is also seen in our cities and towns nowadays. So how can we be sure that we will not get infected by this world? There is only one way. We have to learn cleanliness. We have to keep our surroundings clean. The fly should not have an ideal breeding place or a home in our houses or in our cities or towns. The, the lower loa is also known to cause microfilariasis. That is, that is very common everywhere. The treatment for this is DEC, diethyl carbamazin is a tablet. The only problem in giving this tablet is suppose there is a live worm inside the patient's body and we are dosing the patient for this with this tablet, the worm will die. A dead worm is very much more dangerous than a live worm. A dead worm will cause or it is known to cause shock and death. So it is wise to take it out live. And that is what we have chosen to do here. Now this patient is relieved of all his pain. Now diarrhea is the other worm. That does not manifest like this. That can also infect humans. It can present as small smell, swellings called nodules. It can be under the skin or in the eyelid. Now patient will come to us with an eyelid swelling. We will think it is a sty or a callosity. That is a localized inf infection of the eyelid. But typically these patients will tell, my swelling was here last week, now it is here this week, now it is here. So this sort of migrating eyelid swellings are a clear indication that there is something else in the eyelid. Now last week we operated a patient for eyelid swelling. The moment we punctured the swelling, we got a huge worm from inside the patient's eye. Fortunately for the patient it was a dead worm. And we could take it out and the patient has healed. So these are the things that we have to watch out for. How can it present in the eye? It can be a swelling. It can be a red eye with intense pain and there will be a feeling of something moving inside the eye. This patient was lucky enough that the worm was outside the eye, means it is outside the eye, inside the coatings but just under the conjunctiva. 
Now suppose this worm had gone inside the eye, in the retina, blindness would have been a certainty. Because there is no way we can take out this worm. This worm will destroy the whole of the eye from inside. There have been reports of the worms being lasered inside the eye and killed. Sometimes the patients escape, but sometimes I told you the dead worm is more dangerous than a live worm. It will disintegrate inside the eye and the eye will be lost forever. So the moral of this is cleanliness. We have to keep our surroundings clean.